Sam Comanti here for KRCR our News Channel 7 with another Know Your Candidate segment. This time I am meeting another candidate for City Council in Reading. This is Tanessa Audet. Tanessa, thank you for meeting with me. Absolutely, my pleasure. You uh, formally announced you're running. You're the latest. I think there's now four or five candidates um, for Reading City Council. I believe I'm the fourth. You're the fourth, right? Yeah. And so you announced officially when? Just last week? Just uh, May 1st. May 1st, okay. Yeah. Which. Just today, May 10th, yeah. Yeah, about last week. Oh, we We're meeting here at the uh, Reading Library. We've got this nice setup, the background. We've got all these lights. Tanessa's more prepared uh, to do an interview than I am, but she's from L.A., so it's kind of <laughs> cheating. Uh, but yes, again, thank you for meeting with me. We're just continuing to go down the list. Uh, I don't know if we'll have any more candidates that will announce sooner uh, or in the next couple months because you have till July, I believe, uh, Yeah. So the to announce your candidacy. Well, there's like a filing period. So this yes. this time that we file, we file committees, which is basically our intent to run. And we try to raise money. And it's great for candidates, especially locally, to see they may have a great idea that they want to run. But this actually shows them if the community is behind it. So right. if they can raise money in the, between now and filing time, it's a good indication that they're on the right track. Right. So it's a great opportunity. You know, city council, local government, you want people to get involved. You want people that are passionate about their community to run for office. And committees allow you to sort of test the waters. So people are testing the waters right now. They're um, declaring, they're filing their committees. But then the actual filing where we say, yes, I'm absolutely going to run, um, I think it's between July and August. There's right. about a month. You have a month to yeah. do it. So my point in bringing that up is that Tanessa could be very well the last city council candidate I speak with. Or there could be four there more. Could be more. <laughs> we just don't know. So yeah. stay with us on this YouTube channel. Um, I still have Doug Lamolfa. I'm trying to speak with and other candidates for bigger uh, state positions that we have because it's an election year. Yep. But for now, for today, it's you, Tanessa. Okay. So let's start with the, the broad question where you can kind of introduce yourself. I already hinted to where you're from, but yes. give me more of your background and how you got to Reading. Okay, so um, yeah, I uh, was born in North Hollywood, which is in the Los Angeles area. Subtle flex. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, and I am number two of six kids, so big family. My mom's from 10, my dad's from six, so tons of aunts and uncles, um, huge Italian family. Um, so I'll, I'll talk with my hands a lot. Good. Someone else can manage yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So, but my parents actually, I was born into, they had a Christian band, so we were on a bus till I was seven, traveling the United States preaching the gospel, and um, which was quite the adventure that I quite enjoyed. Uh, love people, love getting out there. And so I did that until I was seven, then we were back um, in LA, and I went to college in, I went to a junior college in San Diego, played volleyball at Palomar, um, and then I uh, transferred up to Sonoma State, got my degree in political science, uh, interned for Senator Wes Chesbro, um, and then went into business. So I did uh, sales and marketing for DeWalt Power Tools, the big yellow tools yep, that we all love. There. Yep. And then um, uh, DeWalt Black & Decker purchased Price Fisher and Quickset, and so I went into marketing um, and repping for that product, those products, um, doorknobs and um, faucets. And so um, did that, and then had three children. So I was full-time home, did a lot of nonprofit work, things that allowed me to um, carpool and um, keep a nap schedule, the important things in life. Important things when you're a model of three. 100%. Um, and then about nine years ago, we moved to Reading. And probably, uh, I would say the biggest factors were having a smaller community for our kids to grow up in and a safe community. And uh, LA just really didn't have the values that we wanted. It's a bit of a rat race. Um, you have to make a lot of sacrifices just to live there, and we just didn't think the sacrifices were worth it anymore. Sure. And so we came up here, and I would say it's probably the best decision that we ever made. So since I've been here in Reading, um, I've been working in government and politics. I work for our state senator here as a district rep. Right, um, in, Yeah, in Reading. And so district reps basically help constituents navigate state agencies that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing or they've sort of fallen through the cracks and uh, we advocate for them at that level to make sure that EDD is doing their job, that the DMV is not overcharging you, that if you get your gun taken away for some reason, we get it back for you. Um, and then I've also been working with campaigns for the last seven, year, yes. seven years here, um, which is great because it's really like a startup business. A campaign is someone comes to me and says, hey, I have this great idea. <laughs> It's me. I'm the great idea. And I want you to help me launch and um, have a campaign and run for office. And so we 
we come up with a brand and marketing and it's literally getting a business up off the ground. Can you give me some examples of people? Yeah, so I've worked for that probably that most people would know. Right. I worked on Julie Winter's campaign. That was my first campaign. Current city council. Current city council, yep. Um, which is great experience. Uh, there's so much door knocking that happens. Um, you really get to talk to people about what they what matters, what they care about. Um, Megan Daly, I ran her campaign for a state assembly. Um, so I. I'm passionate about local government. I have done statewide races, but um, local is sort of uh, here in here in Chester County. We've had an election. I've had I've run ten campaigns in seven years, so that just shows you like we're really utilizing this election process here in Chester County. Yeah, yes. we're big on our elections and special elections and recall elections and so many elections. Yeah. So I've I've, I've actually had a ton, ton of experience. Um, the other thing that I do is I'm a delegate for the California GOP. I'm also a Republican on the Republican Central Committee for Shasta County. Um, and then I volunteer my time on Leadership Reading, and I run their government day. And then I also teach uh, government, God and government, at Bethel School of Ministry, which I teach constitutional principles and values and what makes America different, our constitution different than any other country's constitution. So, You're busy. Tonight. Yeah, well, I love this stuff. So Yeah, well, yeah. then I figured you would hit on it, but... Uh, your background is obviously different from the rest of these candidates for city council in the sense that you do have political experience. When I talked with the other candidates, you know, I made clear that they didn't have political experience. Sure. Uh, and, you know, whether they thought that was a disadvantage. Now, this might sound like a silly question because mm -hmm. it kind of is. How big of an advantage is it for you in the fact that you do have extensive political experience? Well, I Because it is just in the end of the day. Sorry. It is, yeah. it, it, this is, you know, supervisors in a little bit of a grander scale yes. because it's county. This yeah. is city council. Right. This is a part-time thing. Correct. You do it in the evenings on Tuesdays and yes. stuff. So is it really actually even that big of an advantage considering the scale of a city council? Yeah, I'd say the advantage is just confidence. And, you know, anybody that gets elected, there's a measure of you don't exactly know what to expect. And I've never been elected, so I don't exactly know what to expect. But there is a confidence that I have in um, in coming in and quickly being able to acclimate. I would say the disadvantage is I probably know way too much. Yeah, sure. You know, when it comes to campaign promises, you're probably not going to hear a lot from me because I I do have experience of that, what's possible, and I've worked this out with other candidates of like, you know, what you really want to do, but then understanding actually what government does. Sure. So um, there won't be a lot of over-promising. I, I very much have a vision for Reading, but I also know what it takes to execute those things. And so it's a much more realistic um, approach I'll probably take. So I'm not sure if that would be advantageous. A lot of times people no. want to hear that you're going to solve everything, you're going to do everything, but I don't think government solves all our problems. No, so. that's fair. You don't want to make on promises you can't fulfill. Correct. I want to create really good expectations when it comes to government because I think we get super disappointed when government doesn't do the things we expect them to do. And so my hope is to create really healthy expectations of what you can expect from government. And if people want to know where in government those things get solved, I'm happy to explore those things and help them with that. And that leads me right into my next question, which is your vision. For Reading and what you look to accomplish realistically yeah. um, if you were to get a seat on city council. Yeah, I feel like my vision for Reading is that uh, we would be safe, connected, and a thriving community. I want businesses to succeed. I want government to be responsible. Um, and I want us to actually get to enjoy the reason we get up in the morning and look out and feel like, oh, this is going to be a good day. We live in a beautiful place. It's beautiful today. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And we get all the seasons and, you know, all the times I'm recruiting people to <laughs> come here, um, be doctors here, you know, do skilled workforce. It's like we have a beautiful climate and we have beautiful people. Um, so my vision is that. My vision is that we have, uh, we do what government is designed to do. We protect people. Um, that we don't do more than what we're required to do, and that we partner with people in the community, um, 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 public-private partnerships, or just um, resources within our community that solve problems better than government can. I really want an effective government, not more. And in doing that, to begin that, so, you know, say it's the first day, you're on council, what, what is the first thing you're going to kind of try and bring to 
bring attention to? What, what, what's the first like step? Like my priorities. Yeah, because it, yeah. you obviously laid out a vision, yeah. but a vision has to start somewhere. Every project totally. has a beginning. Yeah. You got to lay the groundwork some, somewhere, yeah. somehow. So yeah, I'm, totally. I, I definitely think that uh, there are issues that come up frequently with our local government. I mean, government is instituted for the protection and safety of its people and its property. And so at all times, crime and making sure our police are um, properly equipped is always going to be a priority because those are the things that government are supposed to do. And so I would say um, what's come up frequently in the process of running and talking to people, what they care about, even leadership writing, we interviewed the next class and I would say 95% of the people that were interviewed, when you ask them what the issues are, they say crime and homelessness. And so that is what the, that is what the public expects government to do well. And so I would say that's always going to be a priority. Um, opportunities do come though. And uh, opportunities for zoning and for creating better environments for business, our planning department, like we can always be doing things better. So I would say um, there's a couple of things that are important to me. Talking to the business community. Um, there's a there's other towns that I've been to that do council walks where the city council people go out and they talk to business. So they go business to business. Let's say we're on Hilltop and we go business to business or downtown business to business and we just go in. How are things going? What's working? What's not working? What are you expecting from government? Hands what on. You, yeah, just just interfacing because every time that people have to come to the council, there's just such a power disparity where you have people talking, but the council can't can't talk back, and so you just have this power dynamic that doesn't feel like the citizens are empowered and citizens are above our electeds. Sure. That's how our <laughs> that's how our structure of government goes, but they don't always feel that. So I'd like to go to them. I'd also like to have office hours where people, you know, I work in a, a an office that serves constituents. And so if you feel like there's some place to go, you're more apt to probably go. And it is a part-time job, but it's something that I can commit a day or two to actually be there. So people don't have to know me to talk to me. I'm your city council person. You have access to me. And being accessible, I think, is really important. So making it known, I'm going to come to you. Here's how you can come to me. So people feel like they have a voice again. They feel like they're being listened to and having a dialogue. And I may not be able to solve their problem. City council may not be able to solve their problem. City government may not be able to solve their problem. But I'll probably know the place where they can go next. So they're waiting in the right line to get help. Now, touched on the fact that you have uh, taught at Bethel School. And you attend Bethel, right? The church? I do attend the church, yes. Okay, and have you, so we want to elaborate a little bit on that. Um, as I've said to our other candidate, Alex Shea, who has Bethel ties, he goes to the church, I believe. It can be a polarizing thing, Bethel, in this community. Some people are really, I mean, truth be told, they're just, they're against it. They feel like they have a little too much influence or they're a little bit over the top in instilling their beliefs on others, which is not always, as we've learned in these past couple years, you try and force something upon someone, it right. usually doesn't go well. Right. It causes division. Right. We don't come together. So just touch on your connection with Bethel. So I have always been in the faith community. I've been in church my whole life. Um, I've also been in sports communities my whole life. <laughs> so um, I have always gone to church. Um, when I was in college, I found a church. Like It's sort of been an anchor point for me. My identity um, and my belief system has always been very, very important um, to my value system. And so when I came probably the first time I ever heard about Bethel, I was in another church. So I'm at church, I think it was my mom's church, visiting. Um, they had had a visiting speaker, so we came, and the guy just said, like, um, he just off the cuff sort of mentioned, like, just sort of said something in passing, and it was like, what? <laughs> it was very gripping to me. So he's, he's talking, and he's preaching, and he says, you know, as Bill Johnson says, God's in a good mood. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? Like, I just never heard anybody talk about God like that. You know, so personal and so, like, happy. I feel, I feel like, not on purpose, but I think that the perception is always like, God is, you know, watching and judging and you should, you know, make, make, mind your P's and Q's. But um, it was such a different radical departure from what I'd heard before and 
it just sort of painted this picture of like, could you imagine coming home from school and your dad meets you at the door and he's like, hey, you got to get in here. Mom's in a really good mood, <laughs> you know, or like your mom meets you at the door and it's like, hey, dad's in a great mood. You know, you'd be like, oh, you'd want to go see what's going on and go talk to him and approach him and be near him and or her. And and it was sort of that it was like it was just sort of a radical idea that like, oh, wait, like I can approach God. He's in a good mood. And I would say generally that's that welcoming and that that attention to that personal uh, affection that God has for you was sort of um, solidified in that statement. And so, yeah, so when we came here, we were we actually absolutely came to the church and came for that idea that as a Christian, you'd be in a good mood. <laughs> so you, did you guys come here because of Bethel or did you get here and then discover Bethel? So I had already been podcasting with Bethel, so I was familiar with it. But we came up here to put our kids uh, in a better school. And we had had um, just stuff happen in schools down there that we thought was just not healthy for our kids. And so we, we brought them up here to go to school. Got it. And then, yes, and then because I was familiar with it, um, it just felt like a natural thing. But, you know, like anything, I've tried lots of churches. and um, But, yeah, that's definitely my home. You know, shifting gears completely, I guess, from religion and your beliefs, um, you've touched on what you think writing's biggest challenge is, I think, yeah. is crime, um, if that's if that's what you were saying previously. Yeah, I think that's the biggest issue that people want government to tackle. Sure. Because that's their responsibility. That's what it's instituted for. Right. Yeah. Uh, we just had crime stats released yesterday. I did a story on it. Crime is technically increasing ever so slightly, but there is, there is a lot to be said about that. But I want to instead focus on what you think Reading's positive is. Sure. And if there's one positive for sure that I think a lot of people can agree on with Bethel, mm -hmm. um, tying these two together, is that Bethel creates a lot of growth. They have a lot of people in the community who have money and the willingness to spend and in, in, in make Reading a more of a hub. Sure. So is that Reading's biggest positive right now? Is there continued growth, like obvious growth, especially in downtown? What, maybe something else? What do you think? Yeah, I think that, um, well, as far as Bethel's concerned, I feel like probably one of the things that people don't know, as far as the government is concerned, is that they really believe that um, you, you can't necessarily just say you want your community to be better and then aren't part of making it better. And so they determined that they would put their time and their energy behind that idea and, and told the city, whatever you need, if you need something from us, will provide that in in man hours. So they city service is a part of the school and they have to give their time weed whacking. I mean I've weed whacked and you know you you do different types of um, labor on behalf of the city. But one of the great things about that is a lot of the grants that we've been able to get are because we actually give those fourteen or fifteen thousand hours of volunteer service part of, of the grants that we get from the state like for our parks the bike park, um, the new park that we've got coming up on Lake, happen because we can show that our community is super involved, cares, cleans up, uh, and volunteers hours for the city. So that's sort of one of those things that people don't necessarily know about. They know they're helping, maybe they're influencing, but really what their goal is is to serve. And I, I think there's lots of churches in our community that are serving. It's not just Bethel. Um, and that is, that matters. There's all kinds of, I've never been in a city that has more people that when there's a need to be met by the community, somebody forms a group to do it, <laughs> whether it's our parks and trails, you know, our, uh, mountain biking. I mean, we just seem to rally around things that make our community better. So I would say that's a positive in the, those two areas, but definitely we have grown. But I think it's more important to know why we grew. We were the only city to grow during COVID. Um, our business, Stillwater Business Park, filled up during COVID. And I think that what is positive about our community is that we value freedom. We value community efforts. We value personal rights um, and freedoms. And we stayed open more than any other area. So we are growing not just in number, we did grow a number, but we're growing in our being successful of how we execute things. Um, we have a lot of innovators here, a lot of ideas. We have the most amount of new businesses that are being grown in California. So we're the number one for new business growth. So there's a lot that's birthed here in Reading because people have the space, the time, and the freedom to dream. 
you, and you bring up a good point that I want to now try and tie in to my, my next question for you. Um, there is a sense of community, and there's definitely this belief in freedom and doing what we want and having your rights and your liberties. And that has caused, though, also some division between we have, we have you know, different groups and they, they're very vocal, every side sure. is. Um, and where they are being vocal, and one thing that ties into city council, is the civic rodeo surplus deal mm -hmm. that for now is on pause. Right. But almost entirely, almost certainly it seems, will be brought back up in the right. future. For sure. And for now, it's the riverfront is getting the okay from the city council to be updated and revised, which is a kind of a small fraction of... You know, in the specific plan. In the specific right. plan. Um, all of it comes down to growth and expanding that area that is owned by the city, but that is public land, you know, or used by the public, I should say. There's a lot of division with that topic. And if right. you get on council, you're going to come right into yep. the heat of it. Right. Literally, it's going to be hitting, I think, its peak at that time, come yeah. November. Yeah. Right, November. Um, I always going to make sure, because supervisors is June. Yes, and then, the, the primary is June. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, that, that would be right on your plate. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on surplus land, on, on taking this land and, and trying to renovate it for the public, but also in turn kind of taking it away a little bit from the public? In what way would you take it away? Well, I mean, like people are afraid that the land is oh, right. being taken from them sure. um, by the city because they want to adapt some things gotcha. and, and grow it. And that, that is something I've heard you. quite a bit is, this is our land, you know, right. like, don't touch it, whatever. What are your thoughts on it? How do you believe? When it comes to the riverfront surplus property, I think what I would what I would have preferred and what I have enjoyed in the past is when we have these public forums outside of the chamber. It's not a great place to dialogue and to workshop in uh, in the chambers. It just doesn't seem to work. It's already intimidating when people go in there. They have this preconceived notion that they're not going to be listened to. I mean, many of the people that went to speak and I either talked to them before or after just had this sense of like, it's not going to matter, but I'm going to say something because I feel like I need to. And I don't want people to feel that way. I want them to feel like they're really coming for information and they can ask good questions and get them answered. So I would do more public type forums outside of the chamber, maybe at a school, in an auditorium. We've done planning commission meetings this way where the experts, the people that are sort of making the offer and have the ideas come and answer questions personally. Um, I just think it will lend itself to a better process. People may not agree on the outcome, but at least they'll understand why these decisions are being made and it won't feel like there's a whole other deal happening behind the scenes when it's all, when it's able to be fleshed out. There's the transparency. Public. Yeah, well, process. Like, it just feels like we go from an idea to a decision, and people don't feel part of the process. And so I think that if we create not just workshops, but um, uh, public forums outside of the chamber, I think it'll lend itself to a more uh, sense of a dialogue and a process. You've made your, and this is unlike the other candidates, because I usually don't bring it up, um, you've made your political affiliation no. Um, yeah. How that you're a Republican, you're a part of the committee here. Yeah. How does I mean, and I, and I get the value in letting people know, of course. Well, it's who I am. I don't want to be misleading. No, of course, <laughs> I, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, however, you know, it's council. Usually, a lot of political affiliation shouldn't tie in because you're speaking for Correct. people. It should be nonpartisan. Exactly. Definitely. And I think that's a lot of time why some candidates won't mention it because they're like, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I have to be honest. Same with supervisors. Um, so how do your ideologies and what you believe, mm -hmm. how do you then make sure you hear the other side and uh, the Democrats or the moder Democrats or the moderates and the people that there is, you know, I would say that this community leans to the right, mm -hmm. but there has been an influx of people, especially after COVID, that lean a little bit more the other way. So how do you bring that together? Yeah, sort of the unfortunate aspects of the insanity of national politics is it sort of trickles itself down into local politics. True. And I feel like we've, Shasta County has been um, in the middle, you know, maybe obviously right of center, but has kind of navigated itself being respectful of everybody that sort of sees themselves in the middle. And of course, every community is going to have far left and far right. Um, but hopefully we come together for the betterment of the community. And I think at the end of the day, when I look at 
um, the car fire or snowmageddon or even really even COVID. We haven't done a, it, we're not out of it. You know, we're hopefully going to be out of that soon, but I do think that we come together pretty well. And I think it's a shock when we don't. And I feel like what's happening in the community is actually sort of a shock to our community. Um, I think it kind of like swung people in a direction, but I feel like it's going to level out. I feel like after this election, um, it'll speak volumes about where the majority of us are. And then we're going to have to come together to figure out how we continue to have government do well what it does and have our community do well in what it does. So I'm not, I'm, I have, I have a huge family. So I have Democrats, I have Republicans, I have all kinds of people that I love very, very much that are all over the spectrum. All different types of people, all different types of identities and all these things. And so I think that when you treat people with dignity and respect, you'll figure out how to manage what that looks like. But we really all have the same goal. We want to be happy. We want to be successful. People here in Reading want to start their businesses. They want to, their families to thrive. They want to be able to have families, you know, go to games and coach their kids and, you know, the things that we're all really hoping and wanting to do. So I, it is a nonpartisan position because you should not let party politics get in the way of your decisions. And I don't. There's no danger here. I work for the party. Um, uh, I work in that field because I think I can make it better. I want to influence this party to be limited government, you know, small government, big people. Mm -hmm. So I like that. But I, I, now I have to say one more thing. Yeah. Because I want to make sure we wrap it up here soon so it keeps it at a good time frame. But uh, you had said off camera before we started that the Democratic Party tends to put their differences aside a little bit more just to make sure things get done. Yeah. Right? They don't they don't let themselves get at each other. They try to push in forward. In the public. In the public. <laughs> right, in the public. Um, and that's gonna be crucial, Tanessa, yeah. to kind of put differences aside. I've been yeah. hammering at this, but this is just this is the issue we see. Yeah. There is too much of it. Yeah. So you've of course said now that you have no problem with doing that. There might be a problem with other people, both city council and supervisors, because you guys will work in, in a lot of the same ways. Yeah. A lot of the things you do impact the other. Right. This is kind of an impossible question to answer, okay. but I'm going to give it to you anyway because okay. I feel like you can handle it. How do you get other people to put down their guards and, and come together? Um, these, so these people that you're going to work with. The the other elected? The, the other elected officials. Yeah. I mean, Because we all have our guards up right Well, yeah. And I think that, you know, we do better when we know better. And I feel like um, there's a lot of people that, you know, coming into office, you have your preconceived notions of what things are going to be. But then when you get there, it's just different. I mean, how many times did we all say like, oh, you know, when I'm in this position, I'll do this. And when I'm a parent, I'll do it this way. And when I'm the boss, I'll do it this way. But it's, it's a, it comes with a different set of responsibilities. It comes with a different weight. And so I, I think that, you know, there are some one-offs of people that just aren't going to work with others. That's just playing the averages. But I think for the most part, Anybody that's signing up to be in government really wants their community to be better. And again, I think we have one-offs. <laughs> but for the most part, I think people want their community to, to be better, and I would appeal to their better nature. And, you know, if you give people information and give them opportunity to be successful, people are usually going to jump at the chance to be successful. So even electeds, you know, being a part of things that do better for the city, and put government in a better position of how they're designed to do things well, to do those well, I think they'll come along. Tanessa, I appreciate you rolling with punches. I, uh, I usually prepare these candidates with the questions ahead of time, so I don't bombard you. I did not do that with you. Right. So uh, great job rolling Thanks. with it. We're just, just putting all our pressure on you for no, uh, for no reason. It's um, fun. It's because you're Italian. I'm Italian. I, like, you know. We can, at the, we can the very least, it. we can use our hand movements and just <laughs> find where we're going. Totally. I do that quite a bit. Um, final thoughts. Uh, we've covered a lot. Yeah. You, you, I think, have put yourself out in terms of what you believe and how you think Reading's going to get better. Um, but what are some other things I, I might have missed that I didn't ask you that you want to make sure people know? Um, I just want to make people... I just want to make sure that people know um, I want to be a voice for people. So if you are feeling disempowered by government, um, I want to answer your questions. I want to help you to understand 
what to expect from government and what you should be outraged about, <laughs> and then maybe just what you should get involved with. And so um, creating that healthy connection for people to government and to their community. So many times people come to me and they're just so discouraged. And it's really more so about knowing what's available to them. And they're just not aware of what resources are out there and where they can get help and what's available to them. So sometimes it's just uh, educating people on the amazing things that we actually have here in Reading that make us a successful community. So yeah, I want, I want to be a voice for people. I want people to feel empowered. Uh, I want businesses to do well. All the all the things we talked about. I think sure. we covered most of yeah, all the stuff that I think um, people actually care about. I want to make sure I don't miss anything, though. It's your final, yeah. final remarks. Oh, yeah. So my final remarks are if you want to know more about me. There you go. And if you want to um, know a little bit more, you can always meet with me. I have a, a, a Calendly on my website, so you can schedule an appointment, and we'll just sit down and talk. It's probably the best way to feel connected and sure. to know exactly what I feel about things. Um and then if you like all the things that you've heard in this very long and hey, detailed no. interview, this tough, hard-hitting interview, <laughs> um, then donate because that's how I get the message out. So go to the website. You can sign up. You can volunteer. You can donate. You can um, get the message out further. I like it. Well, I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you for me. I haven't been in this library in a very long time. So. Oh, the library is awesome. And yeah. If you, yeah, if you haven't been to the library lately, come check it out. I think we have 3D printers here. We have a podcast room. So if you've been dreaming about starting your own podcast, but you don't want to buy all the equipment, come on down. You can sign up and start your own podcast here. I'm, I'm just waiting for my dad to make a joke about how he's surprised that I even knew where the library was. Because I'm sure that's what he's going <laughs> right. to say to me when I when I talk about it later. Thank you so much for the yes, time. Best you. of luck in the months ahead. I and it. for everyone that watched this long and hard-hitting interview, as Vanessa said, again, please keep with us. Uh, we got more that are hopefully to come, or this could very well be the last one. I'm not quite sure. It, it's we're in that time of the year where people have thrown their hat in the ring, and we don't know if there's more to come. But stay with us just in case, and I appreciate you guys watching.